On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. So this episode is going to be another group podcast. I'm going to have the guys introduce themselves really quickly, and then uh, we'll dive right in. So we'll start Paul, then we'll go Derek, and then RJ. Yeah, uh, my name is Paul Howey. I'm the AAA strength coach with the Atlanta Braves. Um, this is my going into my third season uh, with the Braves. Uh, previous to being with the Braves, I was with the Seattle Mariners uh, from 2015 uh, to 2017 in Loway. Nice. Derek Mendoza, with, currently with the Seattle Mariners. This is my seventh season, fifth season in AAA. Started off in the Dominican Republic, next year into AA, and five years in AAA. Uh, my name uh, is RJ Geyer. Uh, this is my seventh year of the Washington Nationals. Uh, first two years, I was with our short season club, then uh, one year uh, low A, and this will be my fourth year in AA with them. So uh, the topic of today is in-season nutrition and supplementation. I wanted to have you guys all on because I've talked food with you guys before and uh, you guys have a lot of good ideas. And so I'm hoping we can just bounce some things off of each other. Uh, First and foremost, I just want to know your role in the organization in terms of nutrition. Uh, For anybody that's, that's listening that doesn't know, especially in the minor leagues, a lot of that uh, responsibility falls on the strength coaches. Um, and so I just want to hear what your guys kind of role is in the organization, and then we'll kind of dive deeper into the topic of nutrition. You want me to go? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Kick us off. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah so uh, this year might be a little different than in the past. Uh, we just hired a new team nutritionist, one that seems like they're going to be more, uh, have more availability for the minor leagues, uh, which hasn't necessarily been the case in the past. Um, But I actually put together the uh, nutritional minor league nutritional packet and template that we use as a guideline throughout the season. Um, And really, uh, our work kind of starts in in spring training. Uh, I help a lot of the affiliates uh, order supplements and uh, based on our budget, obviously, figure out what's best for each affiliate. And then during the season, I I check in with them, uh, make sure, you know, see if they have any questions every two or three weeks and uh, work the supplement uh, that way, the supplement area that way. Um, and then as far as uh, the food, uh, obviously we're all in charge of pre and post game food. I end up, I uh, set up the catering for each homestand and then I make sure that we stay within budget, which is one of the really big things. So uh, I would say that takes up a big portion of my time is mm-hmm. staying within budget and having to, while we're on the road, call other places, um, see if we can, I know we have a caterer that we do deal that we do uh, work with a lot, but they're a little more expensive than our budget. So then we have to, you know, counteract that with some with some cheaper meals, um, and still make sure they're good quality. So uh, that's really my role, and that takes a big portion of of my time as a strength coach. Mm-hmm. Paul, similar boat, or uh, are you doing things a little bit differently in your new org? Um, yeah, no, similar. Um, in 2018, when I came over to the Braves, uh, the Braves had just started this uh, brand new, um, basically initiative to uh, really put a lot of money into uh, uh, the value of, of providing our players with good nutrition. And um, so it's really built from 2018 up until now. Uh, we just hired a uh, minor league dietitian who's going to be over all of this um, and uh, in this role. And so basically up to this point, all of our strength coaches order food uh, uh, for all home games and all away games, uh, pre and post game. Um, so for some of us, that's a, just like Derek was saying, for all of us, um, it's a huge task. Uh, sometimes you feel like um, being a strength and conditioning coach um, is a little secondary sometimes to ordering food and catering uh, meals. But um, obviously it's a big part of our job and, um, and the like. But um, I've been very fortunate this last year in AAA, um, we have a very good home uh, clubhouse manager 
and he has lots of connections with different uh, places. And so um, I haven't had to do the food at home, which um, I just do the food on the road. Um, and uh, that's been a, a, a huge blessing, honestly, because I get a little bit of time off and uh, uh, when, we, when, we, when we are at home. But uh, we're really excited. Uh, Patrick O'Brien is uh, the name of our new uh, nutrition coordinator in the minor league. And we're really excited to have Patrick and uh, collaborate with him on just how we can continue to make this uh, uh, the best process possible for our players. And RJ, same thing for you in the Nationals. Um, we've talked about it in the past, but just for these guys, kind of share your thoughts and, and your role as well. So uh, supplementation wise, um, our coordinator, Tony Rogalski does a really good job with, uh, he coordinates and uh, does all the ordering for supplementation for us. Uh, he'll talk to us at each affiliate because uh, you know, we'll have our basic what we order for each affiliate. And then we will have, especially mid season, depending on what our guys use, what our guys need, kind of uh, make it more individualized per affiliate. Uh, nutrition wise, we kind of handle all, all our own stuff. So kind of like uh, Paul and Derek were saying, sometimes is uh, some weeks it's your primary job, you know, 10, 15, 20 hours a week, sometimes doing it. Uh, so mm -hmm. handle at home, uh, handle setting up all the post games, kind of setting up all the, uh, trying to negotiate deals, trying to make your money go farther. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, oversee the home club to kind of make sure that pre games kind of along with the nutritional guidelines that we have for organization. Um, on the roads where it gets tough is, uh, is, you know, you might be going to a city just you know, one time during the year and you're trying to call up uh, restaurants and trying to get the best deal out there for mm -hmm. the budget. So on the road, uh, handle all the, all the post game and working with the uh, visiting clubbies, uh, trying to make sure all the pregame is same thing within what, what we need, uh, what our requirements are and kind of making sure the biggest thing is also make sure it's enough for the players and, um, you know, you're not doing the same thing every single time because, you know, you can have steak 24 seven and they're going to get tired of it after a while. Yeah. And to piggyback off of you guys, um, just my own personal experience with this, by the time you talk to the clubby, set up menus, get catering squared away for pregame and postgame, make sure your budget lines up, take care of the money, um, have your meetings with your nutritionist to make sure the guidelines are met, have your meetings with the home clubhouse staff to make sure the food is good your primary job is becoming that nutritionist at the affiliate. And uh, it is really a lot of time and it is a big investment, but at the same time, um, for me, the, if the food is good, most of the time the players are happy. Um, and if the food is not good, they are going to let you know really, really fast. So, <laughs> so it may be a big investment, but it is worth your time to make sure that the food is good. And I mean, Aside from them being happy, of course, like if we're fueling them properly, like they're going to perform better. Um, so for us this year as well, we are starting to invest a lot more uh, into the nutrition, more money for us to provide better meals. Um, I know there are some organizations that have RDs at the affiliates um, or nutrition coordinators that do all the food ordering. It really just depends where you're at and what organization. But for the most part, um, it is the strength coach's job and it is becoming – um, a bigger area to invest in for organizations. Um, mm -hmm. So, I think kind that's of, a, yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, I think that's, a, that's one of the hard things, I'm sure, with you guys as well. That's that's hard to navigate because you have to really get good at not letting a couple of people who don't like the food alter, mm -hmm. you know, what's going because you're never going to make everybody happy. And right. so you yeah. have to see what what are the big things, you know, what are the the things that are going to make the majority of the guys happy. And so I think that's a fine line we, we kind of have to walk in, in a lot of things we do, not just in the food, but also in, in you know, the, the type of workouts and, and when they work out and all this stuff. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, I think that's really important that you get good at that skill and not let somebody <laughs> waver you too much, you know? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, there's some people that are just never going to be happy. Um, so you can't always like lean on their advice where usually guys that are, are pretty even keel, pretty open-minded or whatever, they'll give you their honest feedback. You have to mm -hmm. kind of find those guys and seek them out more frequently. I have it written on my notes for this. It's hard to please everyone. And with food, <laughs> sure. I would probably yeah. put it's impossible to please everybody. There's, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, even if you do yeah. have steak 24 seven, like RJ said, if a guy went over four in a game and we, or we lost 10, nothing and a pitcher gave it up, like 
those guys not going to be happy regardless yeah. of what it was after the game. If you're not getting worn out by a player, you're going to get worn out by a coach or manager <laughs> yeah. or somebody. It's everybody, man. Yeah. It's like you just got to be ready for all these shocks. <laughs> Those are honestly like my best days is when I go home from the ballpark and all the food was good and everybody was happy. <laughs> 100%. 100%. So kind of going along those lines, uh, what are the big rocks that you're trying to cover with the nutrition and the supplementation that, okay, maybe not everybody's going to be happy, but at least most people are going to be happy and they're going to be fueled properly. I know one thing that's uh, big for us is, uh, you know, special home in a way when we do the set up the deals, whether it's with an outback or whatever caterer we do, instead of uh, one thing that's helped out a lot for us is to having a, two different uh two different protein sources so we may have you know instead of having like a seven eight ounce steak for everybody we'll have a four or five ounce steak four or five ounce uh you know grilled salmon or it could be uh ribs or it could be grilled chicken but that way you know you have more alternatives and but we also have enough so each player can have one of each uh and just having more variety there i think helps cut out some of that that boredom a lot of people do have. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of just, you know, like, like you said, Chris, is tuning out some, you know, you're never going to please everybody. Tuning people out, uh, you know, within reason and just knowing you're just, you're doing the best for them because there, there's, there's guys that grew up on pizza and they think uh, pizza and fries are going to make them better and, you know, sometimes the education of them too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I think that as far as the big rocks, I mean, the way I look at it is nutrition basically has to accomplish three things. It has to help them perform on the field. It has to help them recover. And then it has to help them uh, achieve or maintain the body composition that's going to be best or the body type that's going to be best for their position. And so because of this, they're typically, typically going to need things like more calories in general. They're going to need more calories. They're going to need uh, better quality food. And then they're going to need supplements to kind of fill in the gaps. Ideally, of course, we'd all want to be able to feed our guys all whole foods and not have to supplement, right? But that's just not the reality with the travel, with everything that we're doing. So I, I really do try to use supplements to help fill in those gaps. And then mm -hmm. uh, one of the other big things is I just try to keep it simple. And I think Paul, Paul kind of uh, understands this because of the, uh, the PN way of doing it. I just try to keep it simple and use your hands as serving sizes so guys get an understanding. Yeah of, you know, what a serving size should look like. And it's just like a palm of protein, you know, just the size of your palm. So two to three palms of protein is what we want to aim for. You know, then you got a fist of veggies. So you just look at a fist of veggies, uh, one to two thumbs of fat, and then uh, one to two cupped handfuls of, of carbohydrates. So I think it's really mm -hmm. basically about simplifying things and make it easy um, for guys to, we, we tend to make nutrition so, so this big thing that complex thing. And really we have a lot of guys that don't even have the basics down. So let's just get mm -hmm. to the basics and let's help them, you know, kind of figure that out. Um, and then as far as supplements, um, you know, I try to, like I said, fill in the gap. So one of the big things for me is something like an athletic greens now, now that it's uh, or, or a green supplement, but now athletic mm -hmm. greens, which was always one of my favorites is now uh, in a set certified. Um, you know, and then, you know, fish oil for inflammation, um, uh, protein powder, because that's an easy accessible uh, way to get some protein in, whether I like to have some kind of vegan form and some kind of milk form for guys that can't digest, uh, mm -hmm. you know, milk very well. And then vitamin D, because studies have shown that, you know, we're, a lot of us are deficient in vitamin D and don't even realize it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then my last one is probably, probably creatine, because it's the most <laughs> researched supplement, you know, of all time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, those are kind of some of my go-to. I know in one of the podcasts we had talked before um, is I try to get my guys as many of them as I can on beta alanine instead of the caffeine late at night. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you have those pitchers that in the third, fourth, fifth inning, they come in because they know they're going to be come, going in. At some point, they don't know. They may or may not go in. And a lot of them just like that tingly feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So I've tried to get slow to get guys to just get that beta alanine to give them that tickly, itchy feeling. And uh, instead of so much caffeine where now they can't sleep and it turns into other, mm -hmm. you know, other issues. So that's really some of the big rocks that I like to cover with nutrition and supplementation. That was a little bit long, but uh, yeah, that's really how I approach it. 
Yeah, that's, that's awesome, Derek. And, you know, I, you were the first person when we were working together in Seattle that I heard talking about, you know, using the fist for protein and the thumb and for fat and just how um, simple that was for players to understand, you know. And uh, I know I've – PR, you know, PN talks about that, you know, too, as I was going through some of their material. Um, and that's been a very easy way to explain, you know, that to, to athletes. Um, I'm, a, I'm right along there with you um, on our supplement side. Um, we have a, a great budget. Again, the Braves have done a fantastic job of just giving us a very good budget for supplements. And so, you know, we provide very similar, you know, very similar things, um, a good high quality protein uh, that's whey and plant-based um, and also uh, fish oil, uh, multivitamin would be the only other one that, um, you know, I would add to that list, um, creatine and then a good green. Uh, supplement as well. Um, we like to use BioSteel uh, supplements. Uh, that's so we get our green source from there. But you know, throwing those into a shake, um, throwing those into something that's going to mask that uh, taste, if you will. <laughs> you know, I mean, just to try to get some greens into our guys, and uh, um, you know, any way we can. Um, you know, and uh, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, um, like you know. I, I know all of our budgets, I'm sure, are, are vary and are and are different, but it's it's definitely nice to have. You know, when our organization understands that, and they, you know, they're giving us resources to make sure that our players have, you know, good quality um, availability to nutrition and supplements. So, yeah, yeah. As I said, nutrition is becoming such a huge part of. Um, of the performance side of things that organizations are starting to put a lot more emphasis on the value of good food and extra supplements. Um, and Derek, I actually had it in my notes from when we had talked one-on-one uh, -on -one about the beta alanine usage. And uh, I thought that was genius. And I brought it to one of our mm -hmm. guys during spring training, just kind of talking with him and just the, the reason being, and anybody that's listening that doesn't know, like the caffeine usage in baseball is really absurd. <laughs> It's That's really, <laughs> really absurd. And if we can get guys to get off of caffeine or use it less um, when they actually do need to use it or they feel like they, they have to use it, they're going to get better, um, a better effect from it instead of just continually just hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, messing up their sleep cycles, and then they need more. It's just – it's a vicious cycle that guys get into during the season. And especially, as you mentioned, the relievers. Like, if a guy comes in, he's going to have caffeine before the game and then probably in the fourth inning, and then probably in the seventh inning if he's an eighth or ninth inning guy. And then, mm. you know, your team scores five runs in the top of the ninth, and he doesn't need to pitch in the bottom of the ninth. Well, how's that guy going to go to sleep tonight? Or even if he does come in the game and he gets a big save and the adrenaline's pumping and the caffeine's pumping, it's like, this guy's not going to go to sleep till 3, 4 in the morning. He's going to wake up at noon, come to the ballpark, not have eaten yet. And his first meal is going to be pregame meal. And it's like, mm -hmm. how can we get them off of that cycle? So it's, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and even if you wanted to elaborate further on it, just, I don't know if I, I missed anything there, but just, you know, the caffeine consumption is really, <laughs> really, really crazy in baseball. <laughs> yeah, it just, it just jumps. Like, I mean, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, guys are drinking it first thing in the morning, right, to wake up. Then they come up to the field and, and relievers, you know, they, they don't, well, it depends on organizations, but some of my guys just lift on certain days, you know. They don't always just wait till if they're going to pitch because they never know. So that guy might have come in and drank some pre-workout because he needs it. After he drank coffee early in the morning, maybe two cups. And then, you know, like you said, pre-game, he's drinking some coffee. Then uh, fourth inning, he's coming in and taking some, some kind of P4, C4. And then mm -hmm. seventh inning, he's doing the same thing, you know. And then afterwards, on top of that, he's, you know, maybe having a couple beers. And, and, and you know, how the heck is he going to go to sleep, you know. And then, you know, it's 3, 4 a.m. before he goes to sleep. And he's waking up at, you know, 9, 10, get to the field. I mean, it's just a vicious cycle that just mm -hmm. is hard to get a hold on. If, unless like we can slowly do little things like that. And that's, that's what I'm, mean. it's not, you know, I'm just trying to find different ways of, of getting guys off of things that we know are going to, you know, be detrimental to them. And it's not always easy, you know, but sometimes it's as little as finding one little thing and then finding another little thing, you know, and mm. eventually it ends up working out. Yeah. I thought of like beta alanine with some sort of like random food coloring flavoring just to give them like some sort of taste and taste. like the tingly feel 
And um, like I said, I had talked to one of our guys, um, one of our, you know, he's very intelligent. He's asked me questions about caffeine and stuff. And, and myself and our nutritionist had just talked to him about like, hey, what if we cut this out, um, especially during spring training? And then when you get to the season, when you need it, like we can kind of rev your caffeine um, consumption mm -hmm. up and like, oh, hey, yeah. let's just have a total like deload from caffeine. And how can we get around that? And I had told him what we had talked about in the past. And he was like, that's a good idea. I want to try it, blah, blah. And then um, of course, now the season is, uh, we don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> but he had been building up in spring training to like the days that he wasn't pitching, he wasn't taking caffeine. And then based on the recommendations from the nutritionist, he was taking certain amounts at certain times on the days that he was going to pitch. Um, and he seemed to really be liking it. And so I, I definitely think you're onto something. And like I said, the caffeine consumption really is, <laughs> it's kind of mind blowing to see sometimes mm -hmm. like you, you're drinking another coffee. It's like your fourth <laughs> one today. Like, yeah, I got a Red Bull in my pocket. For yeah. like, <laughs> exactly. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. The, the yeah. talent they gain off the caffeine is amazing. You see, you know, see guys at P4 and they talk about, Hey, I want a P8. I want a P12. So exactly. you, know, you tell people <laughs> it's a P12. Oh, it's three scoops of P4. <laughs> and that doesn't even get them going anymore and everything and it gets bad yeah it's a vicious cycle for sure it really really mm -hmm. is and um to my point with the with originally the big rocks thing um rj i'm on board with you with the two proteins and the variety um for me if i can provide that for the guys um like you said it things get stale for guys and so you have to mix it up um, one of the things that I've really, uh, had pretty good success with is like finding local places. Um, and even guys, like if we're in a city where guys are from or they're close to, and they know like local restaurants that have really good food, like we'll, mm -hmm. we'll set some up with the team there. Um, it is hard when you go to a city one time in a year and like, you want to make sure it's right. And you don't know mm -hmm. how good the clubby's food is versus like outside food and everything. So that is a, is a, big help for me is when I have guys that, Hey, like for me, I'm from Buffalo. So when we go to Buffalo, I know a lot of good restaurants in the area that I can kind of hook us up with for the team. Um, but I do like the variety for guys. Everything tends to get stale, especially if you're playing so many games, you're playing every single day. Like even if you have steak twice in a seven day span, they're like, seriously steak. Like even if it's Fleming's like, or, or Capitol yeah. grill, like seriously, Capitol grill again, can we get something different? And you're like, wow, this is <laughs> all right. Yeah, sure. We can get Not something correct. different, whatever, whatever you want. So, um, but kind of along those lines, what challenges are you guys facing when it comes to the nutrition? Uh, maybe like buy-in struggles that you've had, or just, you know, even like working with different cultures in baseball, um, just what, what challenges have you guys had to, to kind of work through with the nutrition? Yeah, I, I mean, definitely the different cultures is one of the things that jumps out at you. You know, you have guys from all different types of places, Latin Americans, then you may have some, some Asians, you know, you may, then you have Americans, and everybody kind of likes different things, you know, culturally. So that's one of the big things is you always kind of got to stay a standard, like a, a chicken, and, chicken and steak or a chicken and, and uh, seafood there's going to be lots tons of guys that don't like seafood in general so you always got to have a couple of options like rj was talking about um and another one is budget restrictions we've progressively gotten better from when my first year in AAA, um but that was something that was really hard and now even though our budget has gone up i mean uh tacoma right outside of seattle is so expensive cost of living cost of food so the prices of everything like what what like for instance, uh, when you were with us, Paul, in Clinton, Iowa, which you could get for uh, $400 as opposed to a yeah. meal, we can't get for $900, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Tacoma. And so it just, now you're balancing those things as well. And it just, it's tough. And then one of the other things that, that uh, the challenges that we face, all four of us in, in AAA or in AA and above is like, you're really having to balance two big key things and that's stress and inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. And so- you, you have to think of it in the sense of like recovery doesn't just happen, right? You, you've, I, I like to say, you got to chase it. You got to chase recovery. So you've got to start thinking about things like uh, turmeric and, and curcumin, like uh, uh, medicinal strength, gingers and uh, uh, collagens. And, and then that's when all those things start coming into, into place. And uh, again, fish oils because of the anti-inflammatory uh, part of it. But uh, yeah, those are, those are some of the, some of the things that I really, 
feel like we all kind of deal with that, um, you know, is kind of just a little tough, tough areas to kind of navigate around. Yeah. One of the things I've found too is, you know, we'll have, especially having a lot of guys that are on the 40 man roster. Um, I'll have a handful of guys that have, maybe they have a lactose intolerance or I had a guy last year who um, he, he had some sort of a gluten intolerance and uh, uh, it wasn't uh, celiac, but it was where he couldn't have any gluten and he would break out in a rash if he did. And so, uh, so, you know, ordering around that for guys, um, you know, that can play another piece in that puzzle too. Um, Obviously, we're still the minor leagues, you know, but, um, and, you know, but, you know, when guys go up to the big leagues, they do have more options and there's more there. But, um, you know, I know that was one thing last year, um, you know, for me, just trying to, uh, you know, just do the best I could to help those guys out as much as possible. Um, but uh, there's definitely a difference. In, you start traveling down that road. I found this last year. And there's definitely a difference between like a true dietary restriction and a like, you know, dietary preference. And so it's like, you know, for sure, these guys that have dietary preferences, it's like, well, you're going to have to, you're kind of on your own, bro. Like I can't, you know, I can't order all these preferences (laughs) for you. Like you're just going to have to, you have to figure that one out. If you don't want to eat a a bunch of, you know, bread and, um, you know, carbohydrate sources from, from wheat, then, you know, you're going to have to figure that out on your own, man. So, uh, uh, but, you know, doing the best we can to meet guys if they do have a, uh, a true restriction. Um, you know, that's, that's been one of the things that I've, um, you know, worked with. So. Yeah. I'd say kind of like going on with what Derek was talking about, so the, the budgets, um, it gets tough at times, even when the budget goes up, you end up having, um, not so much for home, but, you know, half your games are on the road and you may have a great deal in, you know, say Portland or New Hampshire, Hartford, or something like that. And you go back next year and then all of a sudden that place you went, mm-hmm. that GM's no longer there and the new GM won't work with you mm-hmm. or their prices have gone up. So they want to put your prices up. You know, I know in the uh, Eastern League, Clubhouse Stews have gone up two of the last three years. Uh, but that doesn't, all that money goes towards uh, the minimum. Not it's going towards, you know, food costs. It just goes towards uh, the minimum the club he gets no matter what. So it doesn't help increase what we get food-wise. Um, you know, I don't know how the, uh, your guys' uh, kitchens are at your clubhouses, but it can be all throughout minor leagues. You know, you get home, mm-hmm. uh, kitchen issues. You know, you know one thing... Uh, we're trying to do this year, going off a uh, you know, little bit what you talked about, keep it, keep it simple, Derek, is we're trying to do uh, set up like um, uh, neutral bullet stations to where we have uh, frozen kale, spinach, and vegetables all in a container. Mm-hmm. So the players just dump that in, yogurt, uh, some whole milk, blend it up, make it really sip, simple and easy. But if you don't have counter space, if you don't have a uh, big freezer, if you don't have a dishwasher or everything, uh, a lot of those things are, you know, a lot of the challenges we end up facing. Uh, you know, the player preferences um, hasn't been that bad. I mean, we, we try to do, uh, we have a local Dominican restaurant in uh, Harrisburg we use. Probably one time, and uh, we try to find different things to make it work. But it still goes to, as Paul was saying, the, 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 the preferences of certain players that, you know, I want to have pizza. I want to, you know, I want this. I want that. Uh, you can't do much. We'll, we'll do maybe once a month on a getaway day when we're trying to get out really quick. We might order uh, personal pizzas to the players or something like that as like a, is you can't go, for me, you just can't go 100% healthy all the time. But, you know, players appreciate yeah. that once a month. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's one thing that's helped out. But, yeah, definitely the, the trying to make things work with them budget all the time uh, mm-hmm. comes up a big thing. Yeah, you touched on a big thing that that's an issue mm-hmm. or not an issue in Tacoma is like our clubhouse is so small and tight and we have no kitchen area. So the kitchen, you if, if we were to have our clubby um, try to cook something, it's like way on the other side of the of the stadium. Mm-hmm. So it's just it just <laughs> it just doesn't work. It and just that, doesn't work. So we have to cater yeah. everything. 
And that yeah. throws up your cost too yeah. at home. That if, oh, if, mm -hmm. for sure. if, if you can't grill up maybe grilled chicken for pregame, then you got to order that out. You know, that doubles yeah. the cost right there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that um, for me, I had started in uh, the Appy League. And so in AAA and even in AA, there's a lot more options in the cities. Um, mm -hmm. But in the Appy League, there is not. If you guys have never been in the Appy League, um, our home facility basically had a Little Caesars across the street, a Chinese restaurant across the street, and um, the restaurants in town were like Quaker Steak and Lube, uh, Applebee's, and McDonald's, and Zaxby's. Yeah. So it's like if we were going to get food from outside, there weren't a lot of options. And mm -hmm. even like when guys would show up to the ballpark, it was like a Little Caesars hot and ready and a two liter of, of pop, of Mountain Dew. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to do because there's not a ton of options in this city. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a challenge that we face as much in AA and AAA, but I, I'm sure the younger strength coaches or the lower level strength coaches that are listening to this are probably screaming like, what about all the, the lack of options that we have, yeah. you know, and it's, that's a really, really big challenge. It's like when you go to a city and you have no options, it's like, what mm -hmm. are you supposed to do? Um, I do like RJ, you said you can't always be healthy 100% of the time. Um, I've also heard of like other organizations where they, they try to be healthy all the time. And like, it got to the point where like managers were rebelling and just bought like 40 pizzas for the team or like, yeah. like McDonald's McDoubles or whatever. So if you throw that bone every once in a while um, and show them like, hey, I am a human, I understand that we all eat like <laughs> not necessarily perfectly robotic all the time. Like, you'll get more buy-in with the stuff that you are buying. And then I like the, the preference versus restriction thing. There are definitely those players that like, no matter what you serve, like, ah, this isn't healthy for us. I can't believe you're serving this. And yeah. like, mm -hmm. hey, look at the guy over there. He's been eating this food and he's dominating the games. Like, yeah. <laughs> but let's just maybe follow that lead. Like, it's okay. Yeah. There's a difference between eating to look like a bodybuilder um, yeah. or like a physique model or whatever versus like an athlete. There are definitely yeah, different sure. different uh, looks to that. And yeah. I'm trying to feed you for performance, not necessarily like to have a 12 pack when your shirt is off. And yeah. <laughs> and exactly to, yes. And exactly to your point, Chris, and that is sometimes I've learned too, it's learning your players, you know, it's learning the things that your players will and won't eat. Um, I had this situation happen last year where I spent a ton of money, like 800 bucks on this, uh, on this place that was awesome. And I thought it was great. And I had a couple of players say, Hey man, like you need to get these bowls from this place, man. This is awesome. So we brought it in and spent a bunch of money on it and like nobody ate it. And I'm like, what the crap, you know? And so, you know, and that's early in the season, you know, I'm still kind of getting to know guys and stuff like that of what their preferences are. And then kind of once we found that happy medium of like, okay, what guys like to eat, what they would eat, what they wouldn't eat. Um, you know, I tried to kind of, you know, get into that vein as much as possible. But uh, yeah, sometimes in those situations, it is definitely, um, you know, finding what those guys um, prefer say, as a group, what their preferences are as a group. Um, but to also go back to your point about, you know, I, I was in low for three years and Clinton, Iowa, that, you know, we didn't have a lot of options in Clinton, let alone options in the Midwest League. So uh, I got super creative with some different things. Uh, actually, uh, I bought a turkey roaster that I'd had from the house and I took it on the road with me. And so I would get pre-cooked chicken. I'd have, I kind of had a system down where the players would give me money before we would go on the road. I would save some money from home. I would take that. And then I'd have the players give me 20 bucks for the six game road trip. So, every, so I knew but by this time, my third year in, in that league, I knew where I could get, get food in every city just about. So I, one night I'd cook something, I'd get some pre-cooked chicken and I'd throw it in with some cut up vegetables and we'd have fajitas and you know, all that. And then the next night we would get, you know, uh, Fazoli's or something. And then the next night we would get um, you know, Panda Express or Chipotle or something, you know, but Hey, it was, it was able to work. Um, but sometimes when you're in those small towns and it's a grind, you just have to try to be as creative as possible. Um, if you're the strength coach and you don't have much of a budget because uh, um, it is tough. And uh, I think 
when players kind of see you trying to go that extra mile a little bit for them, obviously that gives it, gives you some buy-in too from them, but um, uh, it's hard. It's hard for, I, I'm very thankful <laughs> looking back that right now we have a great budget and able to do some things, but yeah, it's tough at the lower levels for sure. Yeah, luckily I only spent one year in that league and then I was in double A and, and things obviously, like I said, are a lot better in double A and like even yeah. talking to our high A guy, like the, he's going into his third year. He's the same way. Like the first year it was like, I don't know where I'm supposed to get food. And now he yeah. has a system down where, okay, when I go to this city, I know this, I know this, I know this. So I yeah. really feel for him. So I had to make sure that we at least discussed it because I, to be honest, there's a lot of minor league cities that are in the middle of nowhere and they just don't have a lot of options for food. And, yeah. um, you know, we're very lucky in triple A and even in the double A leagues that there are mm -hmm. definitely good options, but in those lower levels, they're not. And that's a whole nother issue that those strength coaches have. To yeah. Do. Well, another podcast yeah <laughs> i'm gonna do this exact same podcast but with everybody grinding it out at, at short season low a high a. <laughs> uh, you know, along with what you guys said is working those short season those low level leagues like as bad as it is that's a great experience for any strength coach because i know the yep. the two years i was in short season in the new york penn league uh you know we have no visiting clubby so you know, you'd, mm -hmm. the day or two before you go on a road trip, you'd go shopping for all. And then when you get to the ballpark, uh, you'd have to handle, we'd have to handle all the pregame, which means in the hotel room, you're making the tuna fish, you're washing dishes, you're cutting up fruit. Yeah. You're, it's just like, you're, you know, you go out to the team stretch, you run mm -hmm. in and set up the pregame, game starts, you run back in, you know, put everything away. You know, we'd have to ice bag it because another no, Clubhouses had refrigerators. I bring it back to the hotel room every night and put it on ice. So, as bad as that is, uh, it definitely does make you appreciate everything. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, 100%. definitely. Hundred percent. agree, bro. It's um, mm -hmm. those lower levels really. I mean, I've said it a, a, a million times on the podcast. And if people can work in pro ball, they really should. And if you can work at yeah. a lower level of pro ball and really, really see like who you are as a coach, as a person, like your patience and your creativity. I like, I would strongly recommend it because that one year in rookie ball, like opened my eyes to, mm -hmm. whoa, there's a whole different world of strength and conditioning out there that is so different than the textbooks and the college setting and yeah. everything like that. Um, yeah. And then the other thing for me, um, really the two things with the challenges is number one are the clubbies for me. Um, we obviously we've all dealt with clubbies and there are some that are really, really good. They're next level. They go out of their way to provide great things. And then there's some that do the bare minimum and it, it makes it hard for us as strength coaches. Like I said, when you go to a city one time and it's your first time in Charlotte or Durham and you don't know the clubbies and you don't know the situation there, like you don't know if they're going to provide what they say. And like, for me, I can say, Hey, I'm going to provide you steak and potatoes. And, you're like, oh, awesome. This guy's going to set us up steak, potato. It's going to be good. But if I cook steak, you're probably not going to enjoy it. If my dad cooks it and he's a chef, you're going to love it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to assess the quality of what the clubby is going to provide you just from a conversation that you have with them. And that's been a big challenge for me is like, I just kind of assume that the clubby is going to do a little less. And if they surprise me and they do more, I'm really happy. And if not, I'm at least prepared ahead of time in case something hits the fan. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing with the cultural difference, like a lot of uh, the American guys, at least for us, do enjoy having Latin food. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but like every time I get Latin food, it's cheap. It never looks like it's going to get like be enough. It gets crushed and we have leftovers <laughs> and everybody seems to be pretty happy. And it's like I, I had Chipotle for the team one time. It was like rice, beans, chicken, steak. And I had one of the Latin guys tell me like, hey, we need Latin rice, not American rice. And I was like, <laughs> all right, sounds good to me. And, and I, like at the time, I just thought like, you know, it's rice, beans, chicken, steak, like everybody should be happy. And the Latin guys, some of them were not. They were like, I, I want Latin rice, not American Chipotle rice. And I was like, <laughs> okay, like I had never really thought that they were going to be upset about that, but they were. And so for me, that was a learning experience. And then I try to mix in Latin food one to two times, either every homestand or road trip. We have a place in Pawtucket that has uh, really good Latin food as well that the guys really like. And 
part of that, like I get the Latin guys like to help me order. Like I, I speak Spanish, I can yeah. do it perfectly fine, but getting them involved, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, let's get this. What's your budget? Mm -hmm. Like, can we get some yeah. of this? And uh, the guys are going to love this. And I'm like, all right, you know, if you say so, and we get it and the guys are happy and I look over and all the Latin guys are smirking at me like, yeah, we did good. We did <laughs> yeah. Good. So it's just, it's just something that I've had uh, success with. Um, with those guys and it kind of leads me into my next thought um, what advice you have for others or maybe tricks of the trade like Derek talked about with the beta alanine um, just ways that you've had success in regards to nutrition and supplementation with your guys yeah I think uh, going back to one of the things I touched on is man just just keep it basic uh, one of the analogies I learned really well through analogy so I use them a lot is um, and there's this really good one. I think John Berardi came up with it or something, but it's like, don't mow your grass when your house is on fire. And so mm -hmm. it's such a, a crazy analogy, but it's like the basics is your house and you mowing the lawn when your house is on fire is like you worrying about, Oh, how many grams of protein do I need? Uh, when should I, when should I, uh, how much time after my workout should I get my protein in and my, what, what exactly how many carbs do I need to replace glycogen store? You know, stuff like that. It's like, don't worry about it. Keep it basic. 90% of the guys we deal with, maybe even more, uh, mm -hmm. are not even going to have the basics down. So let's worry about the basics and let's not worry about, yeah, we're going to fill nutritional gaps with supplements and some guys are going to take them regardless, but let's not put too much um, of our waste, too much of our effort in that. Let's get the, the, the mm -hmm. uh, building blocks of it. Let's get the basics. And then I think just the last thing is, I think we need to start kind of like looking at it through the scope of, of behavioral change, right? Uh, I like the way uh, James Clear puts it in. I don't know if you guys have read the book, Atomic Habits. And he says something like, uh, what is rewarded is repeated and what is punished is avoided. And so mm -hmm. you're going to learn what, what you're going to learn what to do in the future based on, on uh, what were you were rewarded for or punished for in the past. So positive emotions are going to, uh, cultivate habits and then negative emotions are, are going to destroy them. So if we start looking at it out of this scope of like, Hey, let's start thinking about this is more of a behavioral change thing. I think that can really change the game as far as, um, when we, when we are trying to, when guys come to us with nutritional needs and say like, Hey man, like I'm just heavy right now. Like it's hard for me to, I'm a shortstop. It's hard for me to get balls in a hole like, hey, this is some of the stuff we can start looking at. Like, instead mm -hmm. of just saying, oh, well, you got to eat this, you got to do this, you got to do this. I mean, we got to start looking at it in a, from a different angle because, as we've seen, that really doesn't work. It works temporarily, and then all of a sudden, you know, now he's 20 pounds overweight, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so those are the only the, the two things I would think of. Yeah. That's good. I would say to go off that, um, I like a lot of that, Derek, and, you know, make – make the players a part of the process instead of, like you said, dictating to them. You know, yeah. a lot of times if you get the player to make it, to make him think it's his idea and you kind yeah. of indirectly influence him towards that, he's going to buy into it hundred percent thinking it's his idea or he had a big yeah. part of it as opposed to saying, dictating, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one would be just, you know, I know we all want to, you know, be very much like, hey, I got this, I got this. But asking, you know, you know, the other guys in the league, especially if you're new to the league, ask the other strength coaches, hey, mm -hmm. hey, what didn't work for you? What worked for you? And I think the more we share information that, you know, if, you know, if all of a sudden, you know, I'm in AAA or I'm in high A where I haven't been before, you know, if I go ask those guys who've been there three, four years, Hey, when you go to these cities, where do you, you know, where do you get the best deals from? And mm -hmm. same thing, if we have, you know, I think we have a huge turnover in double A this year in, in strength coaches. If they reach out to me or to a couple other guys who've been here for three, four years, hey, you know, when you go to Hartford, you know, where do you get the best deals from? And we start sharing that with each other. I think that makes all the job easier. Yeah. Just asking for help and, and helping each other out. 100% agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. I think that was one thing last year. I think, you know, Chris, you and I were in the International League for the first year last year, uh, correct? And, um, you know, I know you and I had some conversations. I know uh, Brian King and I would talk quite a bit, um, the uh, tri uh, Triple H coach with uh, Durham and um, uh, Trevor Howe, who's not, who's not there, uh, I don't believe this year, uh, he and I would talk quite a bit. So, yeah, you, you just 
you find those resources with each other and um, you know communicate with each other about um, about those things. Um, it, you know, I I, I do want to go back to the to the lower levels just for a minute and thinking about because I did spend quite a bit of time there and uh, but thinking about just some ideas and some things is you know grabbing your clubhouse manager and beating the streets for you know even a, a first couple of days you get into town before the season starts and trying to find places that'll give you deals uh, talking to your general manager there in the uh, 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 at the at the affiliate and trying to find out who are the you know who do you guys use maybe somebody comes in and does some sweet food or maybe somebody comes in and does food for the front office and um, just seeing if they will give you a deal on things and um, you know just trying to pull your resources as 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 much as possible um, and be as creative you know creative as you can um, in the in, in what you've got um, and but uh, uh, yeah I mean that would be. I think just some some big pieces of advice. And another thing that we do, and I'm sure you guys you guys do this too, but um, we really we really push hydration on our guys as well too. And uh, one thing we'll do, um, and I started doing this because I saw our big league strength coaches doing this, um, and uh, wanted to implement it in AAA. But um, we'll always have a cooler with um, you know Soda Sport or um, uh, BioSteel or some type of an electrolyte drink you know, other than the power aid that's provided in the dugout. And we'll always have that in a cooler, you know, set out for guys, um, checking on that, obviously checking on players during the game, um, making sure guys, you know, if they need an energy bar, or if they need a protein bar, or they need a banana or something like that. Um, you know, that goes a long way, especially as you get into the season, um, you know, just, just, to, just to help guys stay, um, you know, down the field and um, keep from cramping up and um, be able to play all nine. So. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off something RJ said is, um, and I think we all agreed on it is when you uh, kind of all working together, like we're all in this thing together. Mm -hmm. I remember my first my first year in AAA, um, I had I was going into a to a city and uh, I had asked a one of their strength coaches, you know, about you know trying to get the lay of the land, see if they know any deals, and they completely shut me down. <laughs> so that really kind of put a bad taste in my mouth and it was like well then maybe maybe we just don't do that at this level you know I don't maybe mm -hmm. that's just the way it is you know and so what I learned was slowly you know after building relationship that guy's no longer there but after building a relationship with these guys like that's I mean that's that's how we all get by like you know when there's a gym on the road that really isn't up to par you know there, there's another guy that knows a better gym that maybe they don't have a deal with but they're willing to do a deal with us and and so I think if if we can get more on that page, uh, I think we need to get further away from thinking that we have the secret sauce, you know, we all kind of have a really good general idea of some really mm -hmm. good stuff. Nobody has the secret, you know, we all kind of, the way we do things is kind of, you know, kind of helps. But uh, I think the more we can help each other, the better it's going to be for baseball, the better it's going to be mm -hmm. for our players. And ultimately, that's what we're in it for, right? Exactly. And one thing off kind of what Paul, what you're talking about with, you know, we guys do the cider sport and everything. One thing I, I started the last uh, two years actually seemed to work out pretty well. I'm not a big fan of, you know, player fishes work out. I'm going to make you a protein shake, hand it to you. You know, they're big boys and all that. But during a game, when their focus needs to be on the game, one, you know, kind of expand upon what you do is what we'll do is uh, we'll just round up, you know, first, second inning go make for the, the night, especially once warmer out, make nine, 10 uh, water bottles, put some uh, like a drip drop or back when liquid IV was there, that yeah. and some amino acids, uh, BCAs or, or essential amino acids for muscle production, shake it up, put the guy's name on it, hand it to the mm -hmm. guy. One, it's something that because you hand it to them, more likely going to drink it. But now yeah. I mean, it gives them that because it's not something done all the time. It, it gives them a little, that little, hey, that special feeling that you're really out there to try to help him out and watch over him. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. For me with this one, the two biggest things, um, they've both been hit on and I agree with you guys hundred percent is talking to the other, the other strength coaches in the league. Um, Paul and I have had conversations, RJ and I have had plenty of conversations, um, when I was in Portland and just, it really helps you out, especially when you're new in the league. 
um, and you feel absolutely lost and like if you talk to somebody who's been there for a while and they're like, yeah, try this place, try this place. And then you just, it just makes your job easier. And you guys mentioned it. We're all in this together. Um, obviously we're competing. It's a competitor's game. Um, but especially in the minor leagues, like if we can just help each other, mm -hmm. make each other's jobs easier, um, and have our players be happy, it's just less headaches for us. And we've mentioned it a number of times on the podcast that, the food is a big headache at times. Um, so if it's one less headache that you can have, like that's a great thing. And then the other thing for me um, is communicating your expectations with the clubbies um, mm -hmm. ahead of time, both mm -hmm. at home and on the road. Um, just talk to them, let them know what your organization expects. Um, RJ said the dues have been going up and like part of that is supposed to go to food and everything and the, the snacks they provide, like just have the, the communication open with them ahead of time. Um, and honestly, if you can have the clubby be on your side, it makes your trip, or whether you're at home or on the road, just it makes those series so much more smooth for you. If the clubby mm -hmm. hates you from day one, you're going to have a hard time. But if you guys have a good relationship, he understands where you stand, you understand where he stands, like you guys can work together and compromise, it's going to put out a good product for the players and the players are going to be happy. Um, we may not be able to control how they clean the clubhouse or do the laundry. And, you know, that's another big complaint. Oh, my clothes are still wet or, but if we can at least control the food aspect of what the clubhouse is providing and we're providing in, in conjunction with the clubbies, I, I, for me, it's just made things so much more smooth for the players. And, and honestly, the headaches have been way less for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. I think uh, also like, for instance, we don't we don't do uh, we don't really have a budget for away games, right? So, uh, one of the things we will do is is if it's not a place that we've been to, you know, that has a new clubby, maybe, um, you know, we get there the first day and you see what they don't have, you know, what they don't have that you need, and then you mm -hmm. ask them to get those things and you give them specific money for that. You know, that's mm -hmm. one that one way that I've I've gotten around things like that where you'll get to a clubhouse sometimes and it's like, oh crap, they don't have anything that we really, you know, want, and you can't you can't really expect a club. He sent them a list over if you're not going to provide the money and the assets for them to get that. Mm -hmm. So uh, getting in there the first day and really seeing what you need and then telling them like, Hey, I need X, Y, and Z. Here's the money for it. Or when you give me the receipts, I'll give you the money for it or, or whatever, because you know, as we all know, it's, things can get a little weird sometimes with certain clubbies and, and uh, you know, so yeah. And I think that's a way we can all help each other as well. You know, whenever uh, we're going mm -hmm. to, and I know we've done this in, 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 uh, the PCL is with like, if we're going to a new place and, or even a guy reaches out like, Hey, what don't they have here? You know, we don't have much of a budget, but we, you know, we want to know what they don't have so we can get them to get it. And so I think that's a really good way to um, really start to get, you know, some value out of the money that you do have available instead of, Hey, here's our list, go buy it all. And, you know, he may already provide yeah. some of that anyway, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. And RJ and I have had conversations about clubbies and clubhouses in the past. Um, and just same boat, like just the more information that you have ahead of time of a series, um, the better you're going to be able to provide for your players in a city, especially if you don't know that city that well. Um, and having the players be involved in the process, like you guys have said, um, has helped me as well and just being ahead of the time with the clubbies and everything so just any way that we can be available and help the players I, like I said many many times um, today this is a big part of baseball now and a big part of performance is the nutrition and um, we need to stay on top of it um, so I appreciate you guys coming on mm -hmm. I just want closing thoughts from you guys or just any last words that you have for the listeners, big, you know, big takeaways that if somebody fell asleep the last hour or just wasn't listening to us, just <laughs> any, any takeaways that you want them to have uh, to leave this podcast with. I'll start us off. The number one thing is, like I've said, alluded to multiple times, keep it basic. 90% mm -hmm. of the guys are more, we don't need to worry about all these specialized ways of eating. Um, mm -hmm. Just keep it basic, get the basics down and, and you'll be fine. You know, work work with uh, all the other strength coaches, clubbies, everybody else that you work with in the league. Look, you know, learn from people who've done it in the past. What works, what doesn't work. And uh, in regards to players, just you know, treat them as people. Speak speak with mm -hmm. them and not to them, and you're going to get a lot more buy-in. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, and to. 
piggyback right off of that, uh, just a quick story about my first year in baseball. So <laughs> guy comes in on National Donut Day with two dozen donuts and puts them down in the clubhouse and just starts crushing them, passing them out. And I freak out. And I'm like, there's no way you're having these donuts. No way we're eating these. Da, 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 da. So I take them away, you know, That's being the good strength coach, I took them away. And of course, he's just fired up. And so, you know, time goes by and I start thinking, okay, I freaked out there and, you know, probably shouldn't have done that, you know, looking at it from hindsight. So, you know, if guys bring in stuff, if you know guys aren't eating stuff, you know, we've all had that happen. We've all had situations like that. It's like, you know, just not to freak out and uh, just, you know, like RJ said, you know, we're coming alongside guys here. We're trying to educate guys. And so um, I learned a lot from that experience um, of just, uh, you know, stepping back and uh, chilling out a little bit. So uh, everybody needs a donut on National Donut Day. So. <laughs> I was going to say, was it before or after you ate your donut that you threw? <laughs> well, so here's the worst part about that. I took it, then I took them to the uh, coach's office. Cause I didn't know where to take them. There was nowhere else to take them. And so the coaches are like, the coaches are like, Hey, this is awesome. Thanks for bringing in these donuts, you know? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that's, uh, but that's one of my favorite, you know, MILB stories now. Um, looking back. That's awesome. If that's, if that's the worst thing that happens to you in your career, PL, you're going to be doing really good. <laughs> that's yeah. Well, that's yeah, a good one. Though. Uh, you're oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, guys. I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing a bunch of good stuff with us. And uh, I'll be talking to you soon. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks guys. All right, everybody. That concludes our episode with Paul, RJ, and Derek. I hope you enjoyed this one. And I hope it kind of opened your eyes to how nutrition works um, in the minor leagues. And I know we mentioned it in the podcast, but I'm going to bring it up again. There are a lot of organizations that lean on the strength coach to take care of all the food uh, at their given affiliates. And so it is a big part of the strength coach's day in minor league baseball. It does take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and uh, it is such a big part of performance. So we want to make sure that we do it right. So I thought it would be a good idea to have this discussion, and I know we talked about it in the episode, but I'm also going to have an episode where we have some strength coaches from the lower levels to explain and, and go over the exact same things about how they do food and nutrition at the affiliates and some of the challenges they face uh, versus, you know, in the double A AA and triple A levels. So um, I also know that Paul mentioned BioSteel during the episode. And BioSteel has been nice enough to give us a promo code. Um, so the code is in all capital letters, PBSCCS25. And that'll get you 25% off of your supplements from BioSteel. So thank you to BioSteel for the, the code. Um, and then the three things that I took from the guys in this episode, keep it simple and dominate the basics. Learn your players and involve them in the process and talk with other strength coaches and clubbies to gather insights to make your job a little easier. Uh, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll talk to you on the next one. Mm -hmm.